No, he's no, he's sick. sick. He's sick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have one other announcement before we start for people who are here. We're going to do a Sanka set at 3720 Park um, with a small group if you want to come. Um, it's the Black Rose office, 3720 Park, the 80 bus or the 129 from Place des Art. Uh, you're welcome to join us. It'll be some wine and little snacks. Um, yeah. So feel free to come by after this. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. And to the folks on Zoom, hello, welcome, good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to the launch of a Citizens, Citizens Guide to City Politics, a book that explores the future of Montreal citizens' movements at a moment defined by the threats of pandemic, austerity, housing speculation, and insecurity, and racism. Um, the book's editors and contributors are all joining us today, and they'll enter into a conversation that is, or a discussion that is moderated by Jason Tony from Black Rose Books. So I'll pass it over to Jason in a minute. Uh, but first, nous aimerions commencer par reconnaître que l'Université Concordia est située en territoire, territoire autochtone, lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Nous reconnaissons la nation Kanyankahaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Jaage ou Montréal est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons les nations continues, les relations continues entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise. Those of you joining us in the space to get today, once again, welcome. You are indeed in Concordia University's fourth space, um, which is located at the downtown campus of Concordia University. And those of you joining by Zoom, you're welcome into the space anytime, Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. We are open during those days of the week and we facilitate daily activities that allow for knowledge sharing by focusing on what Concordia community members are working on, especially in terms of research initiatives and course activities. Um, so as you've already noticed, we are running this as a Zoom meeting uh, rather than a webinar, which means that you are all encouraged to turn on your cameras and participate in a discussion by raising a virtual hand. Of course, the chat is activated if you're more of a texter, but we do encourage you to say hello and participate um, using your voice sound and or video. And of course, those of you in the space, as I've already mentioned, we do have a microphone set up for you in the corner. It's actually the one I'm using right now. I'll put it back in a second um, so that you're welcome to join the conversation as well. But uh, speaking in the mic will be important so that the folks on Zoom can hear us as well as those of us in the space that we can be heard. So we are live streaming and recording this event and I'll pop the link in the chat in a moment uh, from YouTube. But on that note, housekeeping completed, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Jason. Welcome. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Jason Tony. Uh, je travaille avec Black Rose Books. Uh, je suis l'éditeur um, de uh, Pronon Le Ville, ou Take the City, Voices of Radical Municipalism. Uh, nos événements uh, aujourd'hui est en uh, anglais et français, mais Pour moi, c'est plus facile en anglais, so I'll continue in English, but feel free to contribute as an audience member or as a speaker in French or English. Um, so our event today is a launch of Montreal a Citizen's Guide to City Politics, edited by Jason Prince, Eric Schrag, and Mustafa Henneway. Um, you'll see from this event what an incredible job they've done putting together um, this book and the people who are contributing to it uh, are really worth listening to um, and have all done an incredible job. We're very proud to have published this book. 
We, on October 16th, will launch the French edition of the book at Park Lucia Kowalik, which is on the corner of Park Avenue and Pine. Um, it's along the 80 bus route or the 129 from Place des Arts. So we encourage you to come on October 16th to that event. Um, before we get into a citizen's guide, I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about some of our other books that we're publishing. Um, I'm just gonna go through rel relatively quickly. So you have a sense of what Black Rose Books is doing, what we're up to, um, and you can go to our website, blackrosebooks.com and check those books out and potentially order them. So the first book I want to tell you about is a book I've been working on, which is Take the City, which is a collection of essays from um, organizers and scholars from around the world who are engaged in municipal politics, um, at various cities, various levels. Um, and it's a really nice complement to a citizen's guide. I'll talk more about it later on. Um, I'll give a brief presentation about some of the ideas in that book, but it's a more of a, a broad scope um, that tackles similar issues to a citizen's guide. Um, we just published Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military by Eve Engler. It's the first book to present um, the history of the Canadian military from the perspective of its victims. Um, it's expansive and far reaching. It really goes through a long and detailed history of the Canadian military. Um, and we just published that a couple of weeks ago. So we encourage you to look at that being well reviewed so far and we're getting a lot of orders. So we're very pleased about that. And then I just have three books by um, some Montreal or Quebec based um, authors that will be published in the next couple of months. We're just finishing up. The first I wanna tell you about is Insatiable Hunger, Colonial Encounters and Context by Joseph Graham. Um, it compares and contrasts European historical accounts and indigenous stories of contact to illustrate the cultural chasm um, that exists between, existed between the two civilizations. Um, the poet and novelist Lee Maracle gave an endorsement of the book. She said it's an important work which struggles for truth and accuracy in the unfolding story of Canada and that Graham is taking us in a new direction bravely, doggedly, and with grim determination. And then the indigenous historian and scholar Barbara Mann uh, gave a sweeping endorsement. It's very long, it's on our website, but she calls it eminently readable, clear, and unpretentious. So we're very excited about that book. Um, a book that's very relevant to this space that's coming out soon is The Fire That Time, Transnational Black Radicalism and the Sir George Williams Occupation, which is edited by Ronald Cummings and Concordia professor Nalini Mohabir. Um, it's about one of the most significant black student protests in North American history, which happened right here at uh, Sir George Williams University, now Concordia. Um, it tells the story of um, Caribbean students who are calling out discriminatory uh, pedagogical practices that were happening here at Sir George Williams. And it culminated in students occupying the computer center, which was later raided by police after negotiations broke down. And then the building caught on fire and um, both sides have blamed each other for that. But half a century later, the book grapples with this history. Um, the acclaimed poet writer and recording artist Lillian Allen uh, praised the book for incisively capturing and discussing the event for generations to come, adding that will help to stem the erasure of black resistance in Canada. Um, it includes a award, uh, a forward by the award-winning poet and novelist Kai Kalo, who's a Montrealer, and it has um, just an incredible cast of, of writers and scholars. We are very proud to publish that book. It will be done we're looking at publishing in November. And then the last book I'm gonna tell you about from one of our Montreal authors, we will get to a citizen's guide soon, I promise, but it's um, The Forgotten Revolution, the 1919 Hungarian Republic of Councils, which is edited by um, uh, Andras Golner, who is a Montrealer. It's a collection of new essays about the 1919 Republic of Councils in Budapest, Hungary. It's received endorsements from scholars across the world the book sheds new light on the council's republic in Hungary, including, including the important parts played by women, and reminds us that working men and women are fully entitled to be lead actors on the center stage of history. Um, it's an incredible work that I think relates very closely to the topics we'll be discussing today. It's a, it's a historical event that has not been um, widely studied. It's sort of been cast aside in history. So, um, uh, 
uh, Andrash's book uh, really digs in and uh, re-examines the whole history. So with all of that, you can find all those books on blackrosebooks.com, along with 50 years of other books and a whole assortment of new books that are about to come out. So I encourage you to check those out. We have a new site. The ordering is much better than it used to be. We're still um, uh, refining the shipping, but it's gotten much, much better and people seem to be happy. So blackrosebooks.com. Now, today we're here to discuss A Citizen's Guide to City Politics. Um, it's dizzyingly comprehensive. I just reread the book again and was just astounded by, by how complete it is. It, it's, it's a really strong book. So I want to just take a moment to congratulate the editors again and just say what an outstanding job. The feedback from readers we've been getting has just been amazing. Yeah, feel free to clap. Um, so Mustafa, who's sitting next to me, you can't see on camera, um, will be speaking about the book. Eric is in the audience, Eric Schrag, and Jason Prince, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. He's a bit under the weather, but I'm sure he's here in spirit. I wanted to just take one other moment to thank um, people like Pat Gannon, uh, Clara Swan Kennedy, Dimitri Rusopoulos, all the people in the background who helped make this book come to life. I'm sure the editors have a whole series of people they'd also like to um, to give recognition to, and they have in other in other spaces. But um, it's a really great group who who pulled this whole thing together. So I'm ready to have this conversation about the future of our city and its history. Um, and uh, I look forward to listening to all the contributors. I'm going to pass it off to Mustafa Henaway, um, who can go ahead and take it from here. Uh, thanks, Jason, and, and thank you I, for Black Rose for taking on this project. Uh, and also, I guess I should be thanking also Jason and Eric, because initially when I was brought on to their, this project, which was a labor of love for, for them, I initially was brought on as a research assistant uh, through the Social Justice Fund at, at Concordia. But I think they felt uh, guilty after a year of Friday morning meetings uh, to bring me on as a co-editor uh, of, the, of the project. But I mean, it, 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 it's comprehensive because I think, you know, there was a foresight and a vision about the upcoming elections that's taking place now. And, and very much we had an eye on, on this moment, but not really about this moment, right? And that uh, going back to the first meetings uh, of the book, you know, it was really at a moment where you were beginning to see this, this moment of intersecting crises, right? That uh, the, our climate crises, the, the, the crises of housing and, and, and global finance and, and the power that, uh, you know, financial capital, particularly uh, within changing, uh, you know, the very nature of how we live in our cities was beginning to really become acute. Uh, to systemic racism and the Black Lives Matter protests that were ongoing, but also within that moment of intersecting crises, what we were beginning to see, uh, not just in the Montreal context, but very much globally, was this division between uh, cities being taken again as a progressive political space for real transformation, for real forward vision that went beyond uh, these structures of power, right? That went beyond these formulations of, of, of the market, uh, that there was a, an attempt at this local level to project a different kind of future. When we look at the municipal elections in Barcelona and the anti-eviction uh, movement that led to those, to that stunning progressive victory, or when we look today at the moment of the Berlin referendum, on the recuperation of housing uh, by ma major landlords. When we look at the sanctuary city movement that took place in the US uh, at the same time as a far right uh, federal US government under, under Donald Trump, right? That this division between how cities were moving towards a more progressive politics, a more radical politics, uh, or they were being forced to because of the underlying conditions that were driving them to take these, these positions. And yet this, at the same time, this contradiction of, of more of a sort of a nationalist, xenophobic, 
uh, and pro-market position taking place at the national level. And we see this here in Quebec, right? The, when we look at the uh, Projet Montréal's election and the sort of hopes that people had for Projet Montréal, uh, and then what took place at the province level with, with uh, Legault and, and CAC. And, and fundamentally these crises are inherently acute within our sort of within our context, right? That our cities, and really what this book project was about to show that our cities and particularly Montreal is a fault line. Uh, it's our future direction. Uh, and despite all of the, the excitement and despite all of the challenges, uh, it's in this context that we kind of have to view urban municipal politics, that it's not about uh, looking at the divisions between parties or between politicians, between Coder or between uh, Projet Montréal, that we have to look at the underlying tensions uh, and the underlying struggles of power that are both global and local that are shaping our city. Uh, and in that way, when we're better situated, we can better understand how to actually change our city. How do we actually take our city and how do we actually begin to undo and actually challenge uh, the kind of the, the, the crises that we face, right? And it's fair to say in the situation in Montreal uh, that it goes beyond election cycles, right? And, and in a way, our very structure of our cities, it's easy to say that, you know, gentrification uh, is a force to subsidize increased policing because of the way municipalities are funded, right? And that, uh, unfortunately, the city of Montreal relies heavily because of the lack of autonomy, relies heavily on property taxes, right? Which fundamentally, uh, which fundamentally undermines the right of renters, the right of poor people, the right of local residents to actually have power democracy over their communities in the face of, of capital or of, of these large hedge funds, which are transforming our neighborhoods or these lot large companies that are fundamentally local now. When Henry Aubin, in his study, The City for Sale in the 70s, he very much looked at the ways in which these large hedge funds were actually transforming our city. They were the ones who, who owned the high rises. They were the ones uh, who also had interests in oil, in highways, in the suburbs, in Laval. But now that transformation, as we examine in the book, is very much local. It's the Saputos, it's Desjardins, uh, it's Claridge Inc., it's the Bronfmans, uh, it's even the Rossi family or the Liebermans in the textile sector that are transforming whole neighborhoods. Uh, when we look at the struggle over the Peel Basin or the struggle over now the Triangle, uh, the divisions in our city are becoming clear, right? One only has to go to mountain sites to see that. One of the poorest working class neighborhoods in our city is now standing next to an unending sea of condominiums where people are being forced out or in places like Park X. And that question is, what can we do to change that situation? How do residents actually fight? How do residents actually organize? And fundamentally, who is in control of that situation? And no matter whether parties, what their line is, on the question of housing, they're beholden to the golden rule that the only revenue that the city has is property taxes. So they will always support a kind of a, of a market that actually pushes against people's needs. And what's our largest expenses as a city? It's public security and it's debt obligations. So the logic uh, within our municipal politics don't allow for any solution within that cycle, the issues that communities really face. And so uh, this book and this book project uh, is really about thinking about that, those struggles of power and looking at the city of Montreal through that lens, through, through both capital, through the uh, multinational corporations, through finance, through uh, public pension funds, through hedge funds now, uh, such as, as Cogir or Fiera Capital, which are transforming our city, but to the rich struggles of peoples, uh, of communities, whether it be in Montreal North, 
whether it be in Park Extension, whether it be in Milton Park, whether it be in, 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 in Point St. Charles, which are all covered and examined in the book. But then we have places when we, we see what happens when there is no struggle and what happens like Chabanel, which is covered also in the book. Because when there isn't that contestation, that transformation takes place and there's no, uh, there's no democratic oversight. And so really this book is a rich sort of overview of those issues beyond the election cycles and beyond uh, politicians and political parties and calls the attention really the structural issues at play and how can we transform our city uh, to actually to meet the needs of our residents. And that this local fight is really about tackling the global issues that we face. While they manifest themselves locally, uh, we're not alone in these struggles, right? These are struggles seen across cities all over the world. Uh, and so fundamentally, this is about uh, not just making our city a, a nicer place, but this is about a kind of a vision of a society we want, right? Are we going to, what's our relationship to the climate? Very much fundamentally ties, what does our transportation look like? And who's gonna control that transportation? Are we gonna live in an equal society? What does that mean in terms of, of how we treat working people and how working people organize or how housing is organized for its residents? Right? And, and how do we deal with the question of racism? So what's the role of policing in our cities? So really this book is, is a breath testament to not just theory or the abstract issues, but really concrete examples. Uh, and, you know, Robin Maynard's contribution to the contribution by people in Hoodstock around racism. Uh, Chris Curtis, who is in here in the interview with Nakusat, uh, discussing the issues of the indigenous urban population. Eric Pinot's contribution on the indigenous history of this place is really breathtaking and comprehensive, but then also the contributions on climate by people like Joey Khuri, who's gonna be speaking. So it, it, it is a wonderful work and it's not meant just for these elections. It's a way uh, to us to think about what do we do outside of these elections and what do we do after November the 7th? That's the key moment for this book. Uh, to think through. So I'll, I'll leave it at that as, a, as an introduction. And, and one of the things that uh, we're going to be doing is we have a number of the actual contributors uh, with us here today. So we're going to be doing something called a Pucha Kucha, Pucha -kucha. Which, Pucha -kucha, which is a three minute cycle and where uh, actual contributors will discuss their book, I mean, discuss their contributions in the book. Um, and this way we'll be able to have a more broader discussion with everybody uh, afterwards with not just uh, the editors, but with also all of the, the contributors, because it's really, it's their work. We might have set the framing and the context, but it was all of the people who contributed chapters who really made this book come to life and, and gave it the breadth that, uh, that it has. So it's, it's really not just about our work, but uh, people's contributions, both in practice on the ground, but also in their writing in this chapter. So I think we will. Yeah, so I can, them. I'll go ahead and read out the order mm -hmm. and people who are gonna contribute on Zoom can do so. And then as it's your turn, you can sit at one of these two seats and use the microphone. So I'll let uh, Mustafa take it in a second, but I'll read the list. So it's Linda Gulai. Joey El Khoury, Choki Yoon, Patrick Barnard, Jean Pierre Asset, and Rashidia Marin. Um, oh, she's not here. In spirit. So, Mustafa, if you want to kind of run the show. All right. So, uh, our first actual uh, presentation will be uh, by Linda Gulai, who also, uh, if you saw the Montreal Gazette last week, had an excerpt from her chapter uh, on the question of democracy and power in, in the city of Montreal. So Linda, it's, it's up to your turn. Hello, <laughs> good afternoon. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, I'll start in French. Ça fait presque 20 ans que les municipalités de l'île de Montréal ont fusionné. 
tout comme dans d'autres régions euh, du Québec. Et ça fait presque 15 ans que le Conseil d'agglomération a été créé à la suite des diffusions en 2006. Um, alors, certes, ces, ces événements ont changé le paysage politique, mais qu'est-ce qu'ils ont changé au niveau de la démocratie et la participation citoyenne et la gouvernance? Et la réponse, d'après moi et mes recherches, c'est pas grand-chose. Les décisions se prennent de la même manière qu'avant. Les fusions, on parle un peu plus de la transparence euh, grâce à la diffusion sur euh, des réunions euh, du conseil municipal, notamment sur le web. Euh, le gouvernement, gouvernement pardon, du Québec a accordé le statut de métropole à Montréal deux fois dans les derniers 20 ans. Mais il n'y a pas forcément plus de consultations publiques qu'avant ou plus de recours pour les citoyens, euh, des échanges avec les, les élus. Um, les conseils d'arrondissement tiennent leur rencontre physiquement plus près de leurs concitoyennes et concitoyens, mais proximité et transparence n'égalent pas la démocratie. So, I would say the most substantive and substantial change in the last 20 years is something that wasn't even ever discussed or presented as a stated objective. Um, what we have is more power, most power in, in Montreal is concentrated in the hands of the mayor any mayor, whoever occupies the office. Um, this is mainly because the mayor now, in, since the mergers, um, unilaterally appoints and fires all members of the ex city executive committee, which is the top decision-making body at City Hall. It's a quirk of the Montreal political system. And the executive committee in turn makes most decisions for the city, at the city level anyway. Um, the first party program that was adopted by Projet Montréal uh, after its creation in 2004 promised extensive democratic reforms and electoral reform. But over the years, that democracy plank um, has shrunk and to basically a few promises. Uh, and even those promises have yet to be implemented, such as restoring an elected mayor of Ville-Marie Borough. Um, because citizens of the borough were stripped of the right to elect their mayor, their local mayor, and two of their councillors in 2008. So there's no other party that's come along um, promising democratic reforms. And so we find ourselves in another municipal election campaign. And no candidate is forcing a debate on the fundamental issue, I think, of the place for citizens in decision making. Um, in Montreal, in the city. So the question really for me is, are Montrealers content with having a say once every four years, basically, on how their city is managed? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Linda, for that, uh, for the great, uh, and within the time, and also a great contribution, uh, thinking through the question of, of how power is actually exercised within the city. So our, our, our next contributor is Norma Rantisi, uh, who contributed a chapter on the redevelopment of Chavanel. Uh, with, yeah. with you, Ms. Stalfa. <laughs> so this is a co-authored chapter that I'm discussing. I don't know if you can hear me okay with this. Okay, so it's on Chavanel. And basically one of the things we we're interested in looking at in this chapter is the redevelopment of Chabanel. Chabanel was a place which is in the northern part of this island that was the heart of the garment industry for the second half of the last century uh, for a good part of it. And with outsourcing, globalization, trade liberalization, we saw a major hit um, in this neighborhood, in this district, with a lot of vacancies um, occurring. And so this, of course, piqued interest in redevelopment prospects. And so this is something we were looking at in terms of also what were the city's kind of priorities and orientation in regards to this area. In 2004, there were discussions of the master plan and we start to see groups like the Montreal Chamber of Commerce having a, a key interest in the area and in promoting activities that can heighten the city's competitiveness and that could generate greater wealth. And we start to see, of course, real estate capital entering in to fill the void that industrial capital leaves. And um, 
we see industrial capital itself moving into real estate, as Mustafa mentioned, the Liebermans, the owners of Lamore Inc. investing in real estate. Um, and what we see in terms of the city is basically um, creating or facilitating the conditions, making the space ripe for new investment. And the question is new investment for what and in whose interests? And what we're seeing is a rebranding of Chabanel. It's being rebranded as District Central and as a creative hub. And in the process of the rebranding, we see a new emphasis on new economic activities centered on things like technology and um, still an interest in garment, but more the fashion end, the high design, um, high end office uh, activities. And at the same time, we're also seeing condo development. And we're seeing that condo development being backed, guaranteed by Societe d'Apitation et de Développement de Montréal. So we're seeing that a paramunicipal backing. But for the city's part, what we're seeing to facilitate this new reorientation of the district from manufacturing to being a creative hub are things like the redevelopment of the district, beautification schemes, new commuter lines. But ultimately, what we're seeing is the city making it ripe for real estate investment. And in the process of that, closing off other possibilities. This is an area that does have municipal land, but we're not seeing, for instance, social housing in terms of housing development. We're seeing condo development. In terms of economic activities, we're not seeing the prospects for things like collectively owned enterprises, but rather um, higher end activities that don't readily provide a source of employment for people at a range of working, you know, at classes or skill sets. Um, so it does raise questions about, you know, where the city's priorities are. As Mustafa mentioned, property tax revenue is one of the main sources of own revenue for cities because of restrictions established by the provincial government in regards to raising revenue. And this means the city is chasing after property tax dollars and property redevelopment becomes both the means and the end for economic development. And um, an extension of this is we're often seeing public finance being used to further private wealth accumulation rather than serving the public good. And so I think keeping our eyes on places like Chabanel that has you know, uh, that gives us, points us to where the city's priorities are, can raise important questions and uh, for resisting kind of planning for real estate versus planning for people. Thank you very much, Norma. And it's also an incredible contribution in a place that uh, doesn't make it onto the radar of many people's uh, vision of the city. So our next, La prochaine, uh, pour parler, c'est Joël Khoury, c'est uh, va parler en français sur son contribution sur la question de climat et la, la coalition de uh, climat de Montréal. So, Merci beaucoup, Merci Mustafa. Joël. Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'avais planifié de faire ça en anglais, mais c'est correct. Je vais y aller euh, en français. Ça va diversifier euh, le bilinguisme. Um, alors voilà, j'ai été invité euh, à participer à une contribution, euh, un chapitre de contribution à ce livre-là, grâce à mon implication dans la coalition Climat Montréal depuis 2015 euh, et le fait que j'ai fait ma recherche, euh, ma recherche d'études sur le rôle de la société civile dans la transition euh, des villes vers la carboneutralité. Alors je me suis intéressé euh, au contexte montréalais. Et puis, c'est sûr qu'à travers ma participation sur plusieurs années avec la Coalition Climat Montréal, j'étais à l'affût de ce qui se passait aujourd'hui à Montréal en termes de mouvements climatiques, en termes d'enjeux de, environnementaux, mais euh, ça me prenait aussi de regarder un peu en arrière pour mieux comprendre euh, d'où venait euh, Montréal en termes de, de politique environnementale les dernières décennies. Et c'est ça que, que je relate un peu au début du chapitre. Et ce que j'ai trouvé intéressant, c'est que, le plus que j'apprenais sur l'histoire environnementale de Montréal, le plus que je réalisais que c'est comme si à chaque étape, à chaque nouveau mandat d'un gouvernement municipal, il y avait toujours cette promesse euh, d'une ville écologique. 
que ce soit à partir de 1987, quand il y a eu le protocole sur la protection de la couche d'ozone, qui a été quand même euh, quelque chose de, de un, un milestone, si je pourrais dire, euh, dans le mouvement environnemental, que ce soit avec les différents maires qui se sont succédés, il y avait toujours comme cette promesse de faire de Montréal un, un, un leader environnemental au niveau de l'Amérique du Nord et, 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 et au niveau du monde, je dirais. Euh, mais c'était comme si cette promesse n'arrivait jamais à naître. On était toujours plus proche, mais jamais on n'était capable d'atteindre cette vision, de matérialiser cette vision d'une ville profondément écologique. Euh, et aujourd'hui, c'est devenu plus que jamais fondamental, n'est-ce pas, de réaliser cette ville écologique-là, parce qu'on est face à la crise climatique, on est face à l'urgence climatique. Ce n'est plus une question de un « nice to have », mais euh, créer la ville écologique aujourd'hui est devenu euh, un impératif. Alors, c'est sûr que euh, le dernier mandat de l'administration municipale a été beaucoup accaparé, bien sûr, avec la pandémie. On peut voir qu'il y a des choses très intéressantes qui ont été concrètement euh, réalisées, comme par exemple euh, au niveau du rêve, le réseau express vélo. Il y a un bon plan climatique qui a été travaillé, mais encore une fois, il y a ce risque qu'on voit des nouveaux plans arriver, mais que comme dans l'histoire environnementale de, de, de Montréal, ces plans-là ne restent que des plans qui ne se concrétisent pas, qui, qui ne donnent pas naissance à cette ville écologique-là, qui est toujours à portée de même et qu'on n'arrive jamais à réaliser. Euh, il y a des grandes questions quand même de, de ressources mises à disposition d'un plan climatique. Euh, les budgets ne suivent pas, les ressources, ce n'est pas très clair. Euh, c'est qui qui est responsable de quoi Quels sont euh, les timelines par, le, par lesquels on doit réaliser certains objectifs fait que, Il y a encore euh, un gros travail à aller faire pour donner plus de profondeur aux stratégies euh, climatiques de, que, que, dont se dote la ville de Montréal et surtout comment on va traduire un plan climat au niveau, je dirais, hyper local, au niveau des arrondissements. Comment ça va prendre racine, cette transition socio-écologique Comment est-ce qu'elle va prendre racine au niveau des arrondissements encore une fois, on voit ces dernières années un mouvement de la société civile très effervescent, mais encore, on n'est pas au point où on, où on devrait être, je dirais, encore une fois, par rapport à l'urgence et à, à la crise climatique. Alors, c'est très important de, de se penser pour les années à venir, comme tu mentionnais, Mustapha, au-delà des élections. Ce n'est pas juste une question de qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire d'un point de vue environnemental, quelles sont les actions à poser, mais c'est surtout... Quelles sont les actions qu'on doit arrêter de poser Quelles sont les choses à arrêter de faire Qu'est-ce qu'on ne doit pas faire Il y a beaucoup de nouveautés, d'innovations, de choses qui sont prises pour acquis, comme, comme quoi elles devraient se concrétiser. Mais encore une fois, on doit se poser la question, est-ce que c'est parce qu'on peut qu'on doit nécessairement toujours aller dans cette, je dirais, comment dire, une fuite de l'avant au niveau technologique Alors, il y a des choses à arrêter de faire, des choses à ne pas faire, des choses à faire. Euh, et fondamentalement, au-delà des politiques publiques que la ville de Montréal adopte au niveau international, euh, au-delà des, au des déclarations, je dirais, ce qui est très important, c'est que la ville reste un territoire d'expérimentation, de résistance pour la justice climatique. Et euh, effectivement, comme le livre l'apporte, c'est de réfléchir ensemble au-delà des, des structures institutionnelles, au-delà des cycles euh, des élections, c'est quoi qu'on doit faire au niveau hyper local pour euh, amener cette résistance-là et créer une ville écologique qui soit profondément basée sur la justice sociale. Alors, c'était vraiment un plaisir de participer avec ce chapitre-là et euh, merci encore une fois. Merci euh, beaucoup, Joey, pour le, son chapitre. C'est vraiment euh, intéressé pour la politique de, de, de climat euh, de, à Montréal. Le prochain propre, c'est Uh, Cho ki uh, qui est un uh, militant avec le centre de travail travail des immigrants, c'est qui fait le chapitre sur la question de la ville sanctuaire et, et le, le loup pour, le, uh, pour le, le, le statut pour les immigrants uh, ici au, au Montréal. Merci. Donc, euh, alors, euh, avec euh, ce chapitre, j'aimerais avoir une euh, réflexion sur euh, ce qu'on peut faire avec euh, la ville dans les enjeux variés. Donc, euh, alors, euh, ma réflexion est, est basée sur les expériences du Centre de travail, travail, travail immigrant 
autour de deux enjeux, donc deux campagnes différentes, une pour la hausse du salaire minimum et l'autre, ça c'est la protection des personnes sans statut d'immigration. En fait, nos luttes ont été au début initialement donc, influencées par les succès aux États-Unis. Donc, par exemple, avant les différents États prennent une position pour la hausse du salaire minimum, déjà plus de quarantaine de municipalités ont adopté une position pour la hausse du salaire minimum municipal à 15 dollars et ensuite pour la protection des personnes sans statut d'immigration, donc plus de 160 villes Villa. aux États-Unis ont pris la position comme une ville à sanctuaire. Donc, à partir de ces expériences, on voulait donc faire une expérience dans le territoire montréalais. Et en fait, à partir de 2017 et 2018, surtout, donc, il y avait certaines mobilisations autour de ces deux enjeux. Mais euh, sans entrer en détail, donc, je voulais tirer deux leçons de ces luttes. D'abord, comparativement aux États-Unis, la ville, les villes au Canada ont des compétences plus restreintes. Donc, par exemple, la salaire, le salaire minimum, ça c'est la compétence du gouvernement provincial et aussi le statut d'immigration, c'est plutôt le fédéral partagé avec le gouvernement provincial, mais ce n'est pas la municipalité. Mais il y a quelque chose que la ville peut faire. Mais au-delà de cette compétence administrative, en fait, donc, il ne faut pas oublier que la ville est un acteur politique devant sur la scène politique vis-à-vis -vis du euh, gouvernement provincial ou euh, fédéral. Donc, euh, ma, euh, ma, malgré la compétence limitée pour le salaire minimum, la, la ville de Montréal a pris une résolution et sorti dans les médias pour appuyer et demander la hausse du salaire minimum, donc euh, basé sur euh, la mobilisation d'Unis à Montréal. Et aussi pour euh, la protection des personnes en sens d'immigration, la ville a pris certaines mesures de protection hein, malgré les limites, mais donc, il y avait une position prise et mesures mises en place à partir de la mobilisation de ces citoyens et citoyennes et des personnes de résistants de cette ville. Et le, la deuxième leçon, ça, ça c'est dans une perspective de mobilisation parce que c'est plus tangible et plus accessible. Par exemple, il y a des séances de conseil d'arrondissement donc ouvert à la participation de leurs résidents. Donc, les gens peuvent y aller. Donc, on a mobilisé la participation dans ces séances et aussi rassemblement devant l'arrondissement, le bureau d'arrondissement, mais aussi de l'hôtel de ville. Donc, donc, ça peut donner un une effet plus tangible pour les participants de ces luttes. Donc, si on peut bien combiner le front municipal avec d'autres fronts, vis-à-vis -vis des différents paliers de gouvernement. Donc, ça peut donner plus de force pour les participants. Donc, ça, c'est ces deux leçons qu que je voulais souligner avec ce chapitre. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Chucky, pour euh, cette contribution et aussi euh, euh, donner l'exemple, le bon exemple local de, de loup pour le salaire de minimum aussi. Uh, pour la ville sanctuaire. C'est la prochaine, c'est vraiment dans le même sens de Joël Khoury, mais les, les luttes vraiment pour uh, le climat ici ou pour l'espace le, vert à Ville au Montréal. Um, uh, Patrick Bernard, whose contribution, not just in this book, but everywhere about uh, protecting uh, our green spaces uh, in the city of Montreal. So, uh, Welcome, Patrick, for your contribution. Well, thank you very much. My goodness, that's warm and kind. Alors, je vais enlever uh, cette affaire-là. Je vais parler en, en français et en anglais. Alors, j'ai écrit un chapitre ici qui s'appelle en anglais, je dois voir, hein, uh, Despair and Hope, a Story of Montreal's Natural Spaces. Ça veut dire l'histoire des espaces naturels sur l'île de Montréal, le désespoir et l'espoir. Et ça touche sur le paradoxe central de Montréal quand on parle des espaces naturels. Euh, Montréal, c'est le champion canadien de l'étalement urbain. C'est le travail de professeur Yeager ici à Concordia qui a montré cette réalité-là. Et euh, le Canada a perdu 90 de ses milieux humides, Montréal aussi. 
Et Montréal peut paraître comme une ville verte avec les arbres et tout ça, les gazons, mais c'est terrible parce que c'est notre mode de vie qui écrase la nature. Alors, euh, j'ai été très frappé, dans le livre et aujourd'hui, par euh, les commentaires de, de Linda Goulay, et l'étalement urbain est vraiment destructif. Uh, urban sprawl is intensely destructive, and uh, the truth about us and nature here in this city is that the way we live destroys the natural world around us. Alors, ça, c'est un défi énorme pour les gens. Parce que c'est notre mode de vie qui, uh, qui vraiment est terrible. Uh, alors, uh, ça touche sur une autre chose qui me concerne et tout le monde, tout le monde. c'est le logement social. Si on n'a pas le logement social ici, on ne peut pas faire uh, grand-chose, pas du tout. Et c'est quelque chose qu'on doit faire. Et on doit lutter pour ça, même avec... Uh, avec des, euh, des techniques assez euh, fortes, si je peux le dire, OK? Uh, social housing is a tremendous need here in Montreal. If we don't have it, we're going to be screwed, basically. That's what it amounts to. J'ai une dernière chose à dire. Uh, moi, j'ai écrit une histoire des espaces naturels à Montréal depuis, uh, depuis longtemps, depuis 40 ans. Ça couvre les deux générations précédentes. And uh, during that period, the worst mayor by far was Denis Coderre. Alors, Denis Coderre était une catastrophe pour l'environnement. Alors, il ne faut pas qu'il soit le maire de Montréal encore une fois. Je pense qu'on comprend ce, ce message-là. So, I don't know whether I've used up all of my three minutes or not. Un, I have another minute. Yeah. I could tell a, a story. <laughs> you're, you're, I love you people, it's terrible. Uh, je pense que ce livre est important. C'est quelque chose qu'on doit employer pour organiser les gens. And I think that uh, it's going to take some very militant organizing to get at the problems that really affect us. I was at city hall, city council meetings over 10 years, watching Tremblay, watching Coderre, watching Valerie Plante, with whom I have a better relationship. But honestly, if we don't do something, we, we really are uh, in a bad shape. So, ce livre est important, et merci beaucoup à vous autres, hein? parce que c'était pas moi qui ai fait ça. Moi, j'ai contribué un peu. Okay, so thanks a lot, gents, and ladies, too. Thank you so much, Patrick, and uh, for your contribution, and, and uh... Also, uh, more about the, the, you know, to get into the book, you should really read it around the techno park and uh, and the battle for that for that vital green space. La dernière porte parole uh, dans la Pucha Pucha, uh, c'est Jean Pierre Reset uh, sur la question de logement uh, au ville de Montréal. So, uh, merci Jean Pierre. Donc, euh, on m'a demandé de contribuer à ce livre pour relater euh, l'expérience. Uh -oh. ah. Oui, merci. Donc, je reprends. Euh, on m'a demandé de contribuer à ce livre pour relater l'expérience de l'Alliance des propriétaires développeurs sans but lucratif du Grand Montréal. Donc, euh, ceux qui parcourront le texte, c'est un... C'est un, un rassemblage de plusieurs documents qui, ont, qui décrivent la construction de cette alliance-là. Donc, je vais y aller rapidement. J'ai tendance à parler beaucoup, donc je me suis mis une petite feuille pour me rentrer dans les, trois, euh, dans les trois minutes. Donc, pourquoi une alliance des grands propriétaires développeurs sans lucratif du Grand Montréal? D'abord et avant tout, euh, moi, personnellement, je suis directeur d'une corporation, la Société d'habitation populaire de l'Est de Montréal. Ça fait 35 ans environ qu'on existe. On a réalisé, euh, on a en gestion en propriété environ 1800 logements. Donc, ce qu'on a constaté depuis 35 ans, qu'il y a des transformations majeures et profondes de notre économie, comme de plusieurs économies euh, urbaines. Et ça, ça implique que les défis en, en habitation sont devenus énormément plus complexes. 
Ceux-ci prennent des formes beaucoup, beaucoup plus aiguës et dépassent souvent l'espace du logement ou de l'immeuble. Ils s'incarnent plutôt sur des territoires où ils se posent plus souvent en termes de dynamique sociale qu'en termes immobiliers. Par exemple, on nous a demandé il y a à peu près une douzaine d'années d'aller intervenir à Montréal-Nord. On a fait des interventions importantes dans les milieux les plus difficiles et ce n'est pas une question de percevoir les loyers et le logement social, ça dépasse. Il y a ça, mais il y a beaucoup plus que ça. Deuxième chose, ces transformations structurelles, on note qu'elles s'accélèrent et s'amplifient en gentrant euh, des participations socio-économiques qui font accroître les défis en habitation qui sont beaucoup plus difficiles à relever à partir de nos seules organisations. Devant cet état de fait, il est apparu à plusieurs que seuls nous ne pouvions infléchir cette dynamique socio-économique. Plus que jamais, il fallait s'unir. Donc, c'est les raisons qui ont mené à cette alliance. -là. Comment faire cette alliance? On a d'abord créé un espace d'innovation et de collaboration stratégique et opérationnelle entre propriétaires, développeurs, sans but lucratif et en collaboration avec les autres acteurs de développement sur les territoires où nous intervenons. Donc, on a travaillé avec le chantier d'économie sociale, avec le, le TIES, avec les, euh, les principaux acteurs en habitation. Les résultats attendus de cette euh, alliance, c'est d'abord favoriser la synergie entre les acteurs en habitation et entre ceux-ci, les autres acteurs de développement euh, sur différents territoires du Grand Montréal. Créer des conditions favorables au partage d'expertise et de ressources entre les membres de l'Alliance et également développer des nouveaux outils, en particulier financiers, parce que l'habitation, c'est beaucoup d'argent, euh, dans une perspective de solidarité, de développement et d'innovation. Finalement, encourager le changement d'échelle afin de mieux répondre aux besoins des populations et d'avoir des impacts structurant sur des territoires, sur les territoires où nous intervenons. On est un peu passé dans notre compréhension des choses de small is beautiful, mais ce n'est pas suffisant. Il faut, on est dans des luttes urbaines, ce que les autres soulignaient, les autres auteurs, et il faut se donner les moyens de faire cette lutte-là. Tout ça découle, et je vais finir avec ça, d'une vision économique des grands centres urbains que je vais vous résumer euh, rapidement. De notre point de vue, les grands centres urbains, comme Montréal, sont confrontés à trois défis majeurs qui compromettent leur bon développement. C'est comme intrinsèque. D'abord, les centres urbains créent énormément de richesses, mais également créent énormément de pauvreté et exclusion sociale qui ne se répartissent pas également sur le territoire. Ce qu'on sent dans certaines zones, et ces zones-là se détériorent euh, et compromettent le bon développement des centres urbains, ça génère des tensions sociales. Deuxième élément de la vision, l'arrivée souhaitée et souhaitable de nouveaux arrivants, c'est incontournable, mais cette arrivée-là se concentre souvent dans des territoires moins favorisés, moins favorisés engendrant un défi gigantesque d'inclusion sociale. Cette inclusion sociale, pour nous, est incontournable afin de construire un vivre-ensemble solidaire, inclusif et riche de sa diversité. Troisième élément, avec une forte concentration de population, souvent avec un déficit important d'espace vert, la question de l'environnement se pose de façon importante dans le grand centre urbain. Ainsi, il nous apparaît que ces trois défis, appauvrissement, inclusion sociale et environnement, s'incarnent particulièrement dans l'habitation et les solutions peuvent en partie venir d'elles, de l'habitation, afin de construire des communautés solidaires, inclusives et durables. C'est donc en partie pour répondre à ces paris d'intérêt commun, donc les trois défis, pauvreté, appauvrissement, inclusion sociale et environnement, euh, que nous avons initié cette démarche d'alliance. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup euh, pour le, le chapitre, pour la contribution, non juste dans le livre, mais pour, pour la, la loupe pour le logement euh, inclusif euh, dans la ville de Montréal. Euh, ça, c'est terminé pour la. Petra Kucha. Uh, and so just, just as a wrap up to this, to this part of, of the book launch is that uh, what the book is really about is not just kind of the, what Patrick Bernard, the despair, right? The kind of all of the issues that are being discussed uh, in the book, but uh, the breadth of hope, right? That exists in, in, in the city of Montreal. And the problem is, is that you know, and, and going through the book. And I remember all of the meetings and all of the discussions and all the going through all of the chapters is that the incredible wide array of movements uh, that exist in this city. 
uh, you know, from from the neighborhood level, you know, to places like St. Henry's, uh, you know, uh, challenging the malting to to what's taking place in Milton Park to uh, to the fight around the Royal Vic in the plateau to uh, you know the struggles around gentrification in the Milan um, you know the Milan uh, Nuo C to to the kind of the innovative ways that people are fighting in in Montreal North and and building real institutions of counterpower uh, Park X and, and Cote d'Azur and 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 the fight around uh, you know the climate uh, coalition of Montreal to, to the fight around the techno park, that it was just endless, right? And, you know, to, and to the issue-based movements as well at the urban context, right? So defund SPVM uh, that Robin discusses at length, you know, in her interview of the book or the history of those movements as well, right? That these movements didn't come out of nowhere, but that these movements have a long, rich history uh, in the city of Montreal. And, and, and really the Conclusion, and Jason's going to talk about it more. Was that uh, that you know that we do have uh, power, right? That we do, we are rooted, and people we're not uh, just simply a small minority of activists who who see and view our city this way. But people are really with us. But what we have to think through is what kind of vehicles are really going to get us to that change, right? What's really going to get us in a way uh, uh, to build that kind of solidarity between our neighborhoods, between our different communities, between those issues, right? What's the links that are really gonna let us build a movement that you know, claims our right to the city as, as Henry Lefebvre and, and how we sort of also uh, uh, not allude, but to actually uh, you know, call upon in, in the conclusion of our book is that really we, we need to, to bring about a, a movement of, of right to the city, right? A kind of a broad coalition of, of community organizations and of movements that tackle all these issues because they are connected. And, and it was clear within, within the pages and within the words of the book. And also uh, just to wrap up, there are other contributions in the book that didn't get discussed today, uh, but the people who contributed them are in the room or on Zoom. Uh, you know, Eric is a co-editor, also contributed uh, an incredible both a, a challenge, but, uh, you know, of the kind of these participatory processes that exist within our city, right, that they give uh, legitimacy like the OCPM, uh, whether, and, but it's about how communities are organized that actually makes them different. You know, in that comparison of, of the OCPM's report on Peel Basin, but the community organizing that took place around that. Also, Jason Prince's contributions as an editor, but also as, as a thinker about the kind of the vision, uh, you know, in a very uh, both pragmatic and visionary way of what our city could actually look like if, if we did take over certain parts of the economy. What could agricultural production look like if it was municipalized, right? What could electricity or look like if it was municipalized or transportation? Uh, so uh, he looks at those issues. You know, uh, Rushdia worked, uh, Mehreen, who's on the Zoom call, worked hard in her contribution to bring together the voices of Hoodstock, of Morial North, and people had been challenging systemic racism there for the last 10 years. So. Uh, Really, uh, just again, to thank uh, Black Rose Brooks, to thank uh, Dimitri, to thank Jason, to thank Clara, uh, who really been with us, and, and, and Patrick Gagnon, who really helped bring us to the final stage of the book. But also thank you to uh, Concordia, Fourth Space, and to all of the contributors, right? Not because what we asked them, not as writers, but of people who are really on the ground, people who really who've made a difference uh, in this city and, and, and through their activism and through the work. You know, also John Bradley, who's uh, part of the book, uh, is, is on the Zoom, I think. I can believe I saw a passing note from him. So, uh, and, and his longstanding contribution to, to cooperative housing uh, in this city should also be thanked. So it's really, uh, it's a way of thanking those histories uh, that we can move forward to, to a future Montreal.
uh, that goes beyond uh, uh, Denis Coderre and goes beyond the kind of politics, the petty politics uh, that we see because we desperately need that right now because uh, we're at that kind of crossroads. So I'll just leave it over to Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. And thank you to everyone who participated in that Pecha Kucha. Um, we will soon move into a Q&A where you can ask questions on Zoom or in the live audience um, to any of the contributors who are present here, present on Zoom, um, or to Mustafa, etc. But before we go into the Q&A, I was asked to give a presentation that um, brings my book uh, that I edited, Take the City, into the conversation. I believe it was asked that I touch on um, the, the global crises that cities face. And um, I started to prepare some notes on that topic, but it struck me that most of the people here listening will be very familiar with these crises, the crises of, of neoliberalism, the ones that we face here in Montreal and cities across the world. So instead, I just wanted to go through some of the victories um, that we see in other cities. Um, and then bring it back to Montreal. Um, and these are uh, examples that are discussed in Take the City, Voices of Radical Municipalism, but I think they really relate to many of the things that have been said to here today and relate to the issues here in Montreal. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is there are many remarks made today and in this book and in any organizing circle in Montreal about um, social housing. And I think looking back historically, for me, one of the um, brightest models of social housing um, was in Red Vienna from uh, 1918 to 1934. There was a, uh, a municipal administration um, in Vienna that uh, pioneered a new style and form of social housing that I think we can still learn a lot from today. It was a socialist administration. It was largely inspired by um, the, the field of Austro-Marxism, which would um, have a significant influence on the economist uh, Karl Polanyi um, and many other um, notable um, thinkers from that region. But in Red Vienna, they, uh, the municipal uh, administration passed a, um, a luxury tax on all luxury goods and that included things also like private apartment buildings for landlords etc and what they did is they reinvested um, this money into social housing now the most famous uh, uh, building from this um, time period is the Karl Marx Hof which was a massive I think it's still to this day one of the longest um, social housing developments in the world uh, has a giant statue of Karl Marx out front. Um, and it was revolutionary because it was not um, sad and miserable housing for poor people. It was a good place to live. It was highly affordable. It had daycare centers. It had um, nursing stations. It had courtyards. Um, it had all of the kinds of activities that you would like in a city that make um, life better. Not only that, but this program um, resulted in the average rent for a citizen of Vienna at this time only being about 3% of a, of a working person's income. Now compare that to what we face today. Typically, you're, you're aiming for 30% of your income, and they say that's what you should go for. We're talking about 3%, and that had a liberatory effect on the city. I mean, Red Vienna at that time um, was a good place to live. And there was quite a bit of freedom. And Karl Polanyi himself said that he never felt more free and he thought there was no better city in, the, in, in history than Vienna during that time. Now, to, to wrap up on Vienna, one of my favorite symbols of the city is that on all of these social housing buildings, which many of which still stand today, and the legacy still lasts to this day, um, the, the buildings would be inscribed. They would say, uh, built by the community of Vienna, and then it would say the year by the means of the Breitner tax or the tax on luxury goods. Hugo Breitner was the politician who passed these um, taxes. 
and 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 they were proud of that. And um, uh, I think there's still a lot we can learn from Vienna. It was a city state in Austria, so it had um, special powers around taxation, quite different from what we have here in Montreal today. But some of those powers are being advocated by certain groups and individuals have in the past and are coming up again. Um, so I think it's it's a great model for us to study and, and, and to really appreciate. Now to bring that to um, the contemporary context, I, I, I think it's interesting, and this isn't touched on too significantly in, in my book because it just happened, but the spirit of it is, is certainly in there. Um, and, and Mustafa mentioned it, which is, I think we should appreciate the the significance of what just happened in Berlin. Um, we should take that very seriously, that um, uh, the referendum targets um, landlords and companies with over 3,000 or more apartments. And so we're talking about uh, uh, 240,000 properties or 11% of all apartments in Berlin. Um, there's now a mandate to, to take those off the, the speculative housing market. And that's hugely significant. And the fact that that happened should be uh, a model for us to consider in all cities and in Montreal. Um, while we may not be able to accomplish the exact same things, um, these possibilities are very real and they're happening. Um, to take on a, a different aspect of um, what we're talking about here today, I, I wanted to bring up some examples that are there in Take the City that are relevant. Um, so I wanted to, to talk about um, council democracy, what Hannah Arendt calls the lost treasure of, of, of um, council democracy. Um, there's a lot of talk about the rich history in Montreal of, of community groups in various neighborhoods having a huge influence on city politics and that being something that we should um, that we should strive to enhance and their efforts um, around the city to have more citizen assemblies with decision-making power um, over their neighborhoods. And I think if we look to Rojava, the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, we see there a place today where over 4 million people live using a system of confederal participatory <coughs> council-based democracy, one that values um, ecological principles from uh, 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 the background of, of Murray Bookchin um, and a reading done by Abdullah Ojalan, um, but one that also respects parity, um, that puts a high uh, value on making sure that there are um, people of all genders in positions of power. Um, and this model is quite successful. It's been going on for years. And it's constantly challenged um, and uh, suppressed. Um, but I think there's a lot we can learn from what's going on in Rojava. And I think we should study it and watch it and collaborate and speak with the people there. Black Rose Books has published books about Rojava and we host events from time to time with people from the community. So I want to bring up that council democracy and a, a participatory rich democratic project is happening in a region of the world in which many people are ignoring and we should look at it. And uh, 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 in the North American context, I just also want to note um, what's happening in Jackson, Mississippi with Cooperation Jackson, which builds worker organized and owned cooperatives um, that contest the, the influence and power of capital at all levels. And what uh, Kali Akuno and Sacagawea Hall have accomplished there with their, um, with, their, uh, with their groups is, is very important. Um, and there's an interview in my book with, with Kali Akuno. Um, I think that's a, a model for what can happen here in Montreal. So I think there are a lot of different um, historical and contemporary um, examples for us to look to for inspiration in various contexts in which uh, are brought up in, in the Montreal book. And I think we should pay attention to those and take the best of those examples and look towards those victories and those wins and see how we can implement those kinds of things in our own city. Um, if you want to learn more about those things, again, Take the City is a great accompaniment to the Montreal book, I think, and there are great writers writing about these things. But bringing it back to, to Montreal, I think that we have to recognize that 
much, uh, many of the writers in this book are inspired by um, what happened with the FRAP, the Front d'Action Politique, um, which was a municipal party of workers and citizen committees. Um, I won't go into its entire history because I certainly don't have enough time. In fact, I should sort of wrap up now. Um, but we should also think about the successes and failures of the Montreal Citizens Movement, which is, a, a, you know, another example for us to, to look at and say, you know, what, what worked and what didn't and why. And um, I think one thing in the context of what Linda Goulai says about the power of the, the mayorship, the, the one thing I will say about the MCM is, well, it didn't go nearly far enough at least Drapeau's centralization and corruption was challenged. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in that. And I think um, if you look to the internal debates of the MCM, uh, we see a lot of those same debates happening today um, in a new contemporary form. So uh, yeah, I know that the editors and myself are involved and Claudia just posted about it. So I'll mention it in Pernon La Ville, Take the City the uh, political project we have going on here, we are trying to build a common front, a, a coalition of community groups to try to un unify our voices and to um, really push in an extra parliamentary sense um, for a lot of the things that are being discussed in this book to transform this city meaningfully. Um, Montreal has a lot of unique opportunities because of its decentralized borough format um, and its history of um, participatory democracy or an emphasis on it and an attempt at it at the very least. And uh, I encourage you, if you're watching this now, to um, consider joining on to, to the, um, it, on with Prenon Laville and um, yeah, trying to have some influence uh, in the coming November municipal elections. So that's what I have to say. That was my, my 10 minutes. I went a little beyond. So I wanna move into question and answer. Um, now, we have uh, a number of contributors here and on Zoom, so you are um, welcome to type your questions into the Zoom chat. I have that in front of me. And, or you can raise your hand on Zoom with the raise hand function. Um, so I was going to start with, um, well, actually, we have an in-person question. Why don't we do that? Dimitri, do you want to come to this microphone? So we'll start with an in-person question. Please write in more questions here or raise your hand. Um, and we'll just move into a Q&A format. And if the question is directed, directed at one of the contributors, I'd ask you to just come up and use one of the microphones to respond. Um, or if you're on yeah, Zoom. I want to up. say uh, three short things. First, um, after this event is over, there is an important, equally important event, uh, which is a sans cassette. Uh, and I recommend that you come because I chose the wine. Uh, it's at 3720 Avenue du Parc, not far from here. Mustafa knows it, like the back of his hand. <laughs> so do I. Second thing I want to say is, when I went through this book, I did something that I never did before. And I remind you that uh, I've been around Black Rose Books since 1969, when it was founded. I called up one of the co-editors, Eric Schrag. And I said to Eric, this, I'm very proud to have published this book. It's really very, very, very good indeed. And I repeat, I've never done this before with any of the 450 to 500 books that we've published. I'll tell you why it's so good. Because it is not an anthology of tired academics. It is an anthology of real active people who are concerned about the social issues and the political issues and the economic issues of our city and cities in general. And that's what's significant about it. That's what's extremely significant about it. But it has to be a building block towards something larger, okay? Uh, books can help, 
but books are not ends in themselves. And the last thing I want to say is that Politicians are a problem, all politicians, even those who pretend who are on the left. And I speak from experience. But the real enemy, in my opinion, are the bureaucrats, the bureaucracy. Treacherous cockroaches, never to be trusted. The bureaucrats, and they're the ones who distort history and refuse to acknowledge your presence and mine. They do so very reluctantly because they may be sitting behind a politician who says, well, take their account, take their comments into account. Don't trust the bureaucrats. And one of the biggest failures of the Montreal Citizens Movement, as is the case with Projet Montréal, is that they're manipulated by bureaucrats without being even aware of it. I remember once coming out of a very heavy political meeting in City Hall, and uh, you know there were all sorts of top politicians there, and this guy comes up to me and he says, you know, Monsieur Rosopoulos, les élus sont toujours agréables à rencontrer, mais vous savez, nous, les fonctionnaires, on est toujours là et on est là pour la vie. How do you like that? Right in my face, he said it. I mean, do you kill him on the spot or not? And drive your heel into the ground after you do that. Unbelievable. My last comment is never forget that the city of Montreal has the biggest bureaucracy of any city in North America. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, is there anybody who, who wants to have any kind of response to that? No, okay, fair. So again, I encourage you to write questions into the chat or raise your hand if you're on Zoom um, or just let me know. But um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a great um, comment on, on Choki's presentation that, that I wanna make sure is heard by Choki, um, that I invite you Choki to, to respond to if you have anything to respond with. Um, Jaggi Singh wrote it. Jaggi, you're welcome to, to say this uh, on voice if you want to. I'll give them a minute. Otherwise, I'll just read it. Okay. Don't hear him um, or them. So I'm going to just read this um, uh, as the people who are physically here can't see these comments. So uh, Jaggi Singh writes, regarding Choki's presentation, I would suggest that there are two things that the city of Montreal can do relating directly to the idea of a sanctuary city. One, directing the STM and the SPVM to cease collaborating with the CBSA, the Canada Border Service Agency. Two, not allow the CBSA access to any municipal controlled spaces, borough offices, libraries, municipal parks and community centers, etc. The first is tangible and will provide a certain degree of security to the thousands of Montrealers who are currently under the removal orders, i.e. not fearing being deported due to an often banal, banal interaction with the police. The second is somewhat symbolic, but is part of a larger effort to deny the CBSA access to spaces, um, schools, colleges, universities, can deny the CBS a the space to operate effectively within Montreal. So Chucky, I'm not sure if you have um, a reply to that. Um, I know Mustafa, this would be related to some of the work you do. So yeah, go ahead, Chucky. Yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Jackie, for the comments. Uh, yeah, so actually that's uh, the real definition of the sanctuary city. And uh, at this moment in Montreal is uh, really limited and that's, exactly why the, the mayor revoked uh, the declaration as a sanctuary city, uh, 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 Montreal as a sanctuary city, because actually it's still, so we are in still in conversation, but uh, particularly the police uh, does not accept uh, to the principle of uh, not communicating with the CBSA, so, so the service uh, frontalier. So actually that, that's uh, the most essential element of the sanctuary city 
and which is which is not kept yet. Uh, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> the, the the gain uh, through the conversation and the mobilization within the city is very much limited in Montreal. Yeah, and uh, we need to still keep uh, fighting for that uh, and in different levels. So I totally agree with that, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I guess this is a question for Concordia or the spacers. Um, some people said they emailed their questions to info.4 at concordia.ca. So maybe somebody could send those over to me or post them in the, the chat. Um, oh, I hear footsteps. Okay, you have some questions. No, you're okay. Okay, one second, we're gonna get to email questions. Are there any questions? The okay, chat? we have one from Scott. Weinstein. Um, and again, feel free to ask these, like Scott, if you're in the Zoom and you want to speak up, you can unmute yourself and speak if you prefer. Um, but I'll go ahead and um, read this question from Scott, uh, assuming he doesn't speak up in a moment. So Scott writes, often when I ask Montreal City Councilors about changes such as the, the launching of COVID vaccination vans into disempowered neighborhoods, where many essential workers are not vaccinated or attacking the housing crisis by enforcing serious rent controls, stopping the condoization of rental housing and providing tens of thousands of nonprofit co-op apartment units. They reply that the city of Montreal does not have the legal power to solve those issues. Those are controlled by provincial, federal or global free trade accord laws. Can the city of Montreal make socialist structural change that reverse some of capitalism's egregious municipal inequalities when it lacks economic and political control of fundamental everyday life issues such as healthcare and housing? That's from Scott Weinstein. Any of the contributors want to reply to that? Eric, go ahead. This is Eric Schrag, who's been um, patiently waiting in the audience. Is this on? Yes. Okay, it's a great question, Scott. It's central to our book. Um, in, in developing the book, we had long discussions about this issue. And the question was, yes, so they're, they're, the city is the weakest form of government. It does not have power to do many things. The question is, can the city align itself with social movements and with um, community organizations to become a force to pressure higher levels of government? to make the changes necessary. So that's the kind of analysis we had in the book. The, the city, if it kind of sits back and says, oh, it's beyond our mandate, it's wasting our time. And I think what we have to see is, is whether the city can be kind of um, as, a, as a parallel to a community organizer to mobilize the forces for social justice and, and change and, and put pressure on higher levels of government. Um, there are examples of that. And we, we see from time to time, the city taking a position demanding more social housing, for example. The, the problem is that it doesn't mobilize its allies on the ground to make that a real force for social change. So the vision in the book is that the city has to play that kind of role. Thank you. So Eric, maybe you'll stand there because there is a related question that came in from, I think it was Matthew Chapman. Yes, Matthew Chapman just asked a very simple question that I think is related to your answer. So I'm just gonna ask it again to make sure it gets in there. But he said, thank you for sharing the Berlin precedent with us and shared an article for people to read about Berlin and said, who do you see as logical actors to take this kind of effort forward in Montreal? Yeah, um, clearly, let me go back a step. So Pernod Latville, the initiative we've taken was based on the idea that two things are happening. One is community groups are focusing often on the province and not on the city. Secondly, that everyone lives in their little silos. So what we're trying to do with that is, is break these silos and pull together environment groups and housing groups and target the city to put pressure on the city to move forward with these kinds of demands. I think um, from what I understand about Berlin is that there is, they have a constitutional right to do that within the city framework and we don't in Montreal. So we'd have to have leadership from the city to demand that kind of power. 
supported by a broad-based community and social movements to do that. Um, I'd like to ask a question that I had anticipated asking at some point, but I think now is the time. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd like to ask it to you, Eric, do you take seriously this notion of making Montreal a city state or something that resembles one? Is that a serious uh, political um, statement or goal? Is that something worth focusing on? I know Leonard Cohen was a big advocate of that in the past and it's, it's coming up again. I won't name names, but there are um, you know, mayoral candidates who were talking about that and citizen groups. I mean, what do you think of, of that idea? Um, clearly, to do what we need to do, we, the city needs increased powers. We live in a context where I don't see how that's going to happen without a real shift on the ground and supporting that kind of demand for power. Um, we live in currently with, with a government in Quebec City that doesn't really care about the city at all. We live in a fed, with a federal government that doesn't even have a, a municipal appear, affairs ministry. So neither government, level of government wants to give up their power. So it has to be something that's going to be fought for hmm. and fought for with, with, with a constitutional change. But it's not going to come unless there's really bottom-up organization that's going to actually take power and force that kind of change rather than waiting for some level of government to change the constitution of Canada. Hmm. Great. So hence Pernon La Ville. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear your answer to that question. I agree with you. Um, I'm going to take another, oh, uh, Sam Bosky noted that uh, Norman Mailer ran for mayor of New York on the platform of a city state. Um, thank you for that note. I'm going to move back to email questions. So the next emailed question was from uh, Berta Kaiser. I said that right. Hello, my question is COVID has parenthetical most likely led to an increase in municipal government investments. Is this the kind of investment, is this kind of investment sustainable in the long term? If not, how, we, how can we continue to fund new local initiatives and priorities without compromising is existing services and initiatives. Um, are there any immediate responses to this? If not, I'll just ask another question. And then if people want to touch on both of them. So the next um, question is from um, Madeline uh, Helena. Oh, that's not a real question. Um, this one's from Christian Meyer. Oh, that's not a real question either. <laughs> okay, some of these questions are questions about other things. So those were the emailed questions. I'm going to leave those there. We have a question in the chat. Sorry, I, I swear I wasn't reading your emails, Anna. Um, although I, that's exactly what I was doing. Um, <laughs> uh, historically, is there a political party in Montreal that has significantly changed the bureaucracy for greater democracy? So we have two questions. One's about sustainable investment in the time of COVID and whether it will be sustainable. And the other is about um, uh, significant change in bureaucracy for greater democracy. Mustafa, go ahead. Uh, just on the, the COVID and, and municipal investment, I mean, there's, there's, there's two responses. I mean, one, which is unique. There's a lot of, uh, you know, all of a sudden we have this crisis of downtown, right? We have to save downtown, right? That downtown, uh, that downtown uh, got the worst of, of COVID in terms of the economic effects of, of, of sort of the downturn that no one is coming downtown. And no one raised the question is that, uh, okay, to, to save the small businesses, but to save uh, Fairview Cadillac, to save BMO, to save, who are we saving when we're saving quote unquote downtown, right? And so, uh, and to bring people back downtown. And so it poses the kind of question of when Montreal was investing and in trying to subsidize and support downtown uh, and, and the downtown business associations, who are we saving? And downtown has been, always a historical example of always needing saving, right? It was 
It needed saving in the 90s when you saw Cartier International, uh, in which all of the big uh, players essentially got away with downtown real estate at a fraction of the price. Uh, and the city lost money at the end. So when we talk about a sustainable investment, but on the other side, uh, there was this kind of investment into different neighborhoods, into cultural activities uh, over the last two, two summers, uh, the ability to all of a sudden turn to, to make a whole set of streets pedestrian like that overnight. Uh, all, we had a range of pedestrian streets uh, in the summer, car free. Uh, so it's clear when people say, well, the city doesn't have powers over certain things, but then the city ultimately does have power over certain things as well, right? And, and, and that made our city for the better. So it wasn't even the things that they uh, invested financial uh, uh, resources in, right? But I mean, some of the things that the city could have done during COVID, uh, is to, and I mean, in some instances had, had done so, uh, support community groups that were on the front lines of, of, of dealing with the fallout of, of COVID-19, particularly groups working in, in Montreal North or groups like the Immigrant Workers Center that were dealing with people who were deeply infected by uh, COVID-19. And it was clear that uh, when people talk about sustainable investments, if you go back, there's a very public, you can find on the city website, uh, kind of the spending on these programs for the city is really a fraction of their budget. It's, you know, we're talking two to 3% of the budget, right? A third of the city's budget goes into two things. And, and I was saying that at the beginning, uh, 17 to 18% for policing and 17 to 18% for debt obligations. Right. Uh, so, uh, what it spends on uh, sort of these social investments is is very little. Uh, so we, if we weren't paying banks or police, we could actually have a much nicer community. So I think a lot of those investments uh, are sustainable. Thanks. Mustafa, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a stab at Maria's question um, and read what Sam Bosky said in response to it, which I think is true. Um, Sam said, I would suggest that the Montreal Citizen Movement's changes in 1987, restructuring the city services, setting up commissions of council with public participation, etc., was a first step in that direction, but momentum was lost and the 2001 Un re-centralized too much. So I think I, I agree with Sam. And um, in the introduction to Take the City, I write about the Montreal Citizens Movement and its, its history. Um, my research was mostly based on some of the internal conflicts in the early days of the party. I thought that was the most interesting aspect of the MCM is, is you had um, pragmatists on one hand who were associated more with the kind of like neoliberal progressivism. And then you had um, uh, a more radical sect in the party that was uh, more socialist oriented. And <clears throat> essential to the founding of the MCM and largely inspired by the frat was this idea that um, there should be councils in every neighborhood with decision-making power. Now, the FRAP had a bold agenda um, that fell apart with the October crisis in this sense, but the MCM adopted that in spirit, included it in some of its early um, materials, but it was never really accomplished. The closest they came, in my view, was an attempt, and it was a, 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 a very failed one, to create what they called district advisory committees, the DACs, which had the power only to make uh, requests or you know, requests or queries to the government about some issue to be able to get them spoken about at city hall. But it was entirely inadequate, but it was an attempt and the MCM in spirit represented you know, a fight against bureaucracy. As Dimitri's comment noted, it was, I think, an important failure. Dimitri says, and I think it's true, one of its greatest failures was to, to, to fight this. But, you know, there were attempts to take some of the power away from these bureaucratic institutions and put them into 
um, a, a, a council um, system, um, but it didn't really happen. And the district advisory committees are an interesting history. They did get some things done. There were some action taken, but it really relied on citizens taking issues forward and they probably could have done it through other mechanisms anyway. So I wouldn't say it was much of a success. Um, I have a question in person. Um, you can come and take the microphone and ask your question and then stuff coming in after. Thanks. Uh, what's your name? One, two. My name is Nicolas Chevalier. Oh. Uh, I'm a student here at Concordia doing an environmental science bachelor's. I'm also um, a member of Climate Justice Montreal. I also do admin work with Mutual Aid Montreal on Facebook. We need administrators if everybody's interested. Uh, but here at Concordia, I am supporting a project called uh, SEAS, so Socialist or Solidarity Economy Incubation Zone, which if it passes at referendum this fall, will get funding to start a solidarity economy in Concordia and around Montreal hopefully displacing some capitalist force. Uh, my question after all my plugs is that uh, I wonder what uh, the authors who are part of academia, some of them are professors, some of them I've had the privilege of have, being assumed for, think of the possibility of mobilizing students knowing that uh, Concordia itself is sort of an extractive industry uh, for the knowledge they offer to students and how faculty has to be sort of a counterpower to that. I say this knowing that we're now back in person and the university has already taken away many measures that made it easier for students to be here. Uh, so my question is, what potential do you see for the student body, for faculty and for Concordia? Do you see it more as a positive possible or a problem for municipal societies? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, our Norma, I think you'd be a, a logical person to respond to this. I could speak as well to it. Jason Prince here in the corner. Oh, Jason Prince, the voice He's from above. Um, uh, well, why don't we have Jason go and then Norma, you can go after. Welcome, Jason, wherever you are. <laughs> All right, I'll throw some video on. I'm very sick and I'm in bed, so I apologize. I'm following along. Uh, so, you know, there are, what, 200,000 students in Montreal, including the Sage Epi University students. Um, our communities, our university communities are extremely important uh, groups of people. Um, uh, the campuses are a great place to be driving change. We know that. Historically, they play a fundamental role. So the CES initiative, if I understand your question, the CES initiative at Concordia, Concordia University has about maybe eight, maybe 10 different collective enterprises running parts of the campus economy. And um, uh, there's been a great push to take control of food. So I, I think, I think that, that, that Concordia could become a great leader, not only in, in Montreal, but across, across, uh, across Canada. And it needs to, it needs to, it, it, but it, it must, because I teach the social economy, it's got to be careful to make sure that you are doing the work um, uh, b borrowing the, the business principles from capitalism. I know I'm going to put that that way. Um, you have to be careful to make sure that you have sound business models. We're going to be working inside of an economy with, uh, with a, you know, a cash economy, and we need to make sure that people get paid fair wages. We can't, we can't, we can't uh, sacrifice that against the the, the 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 success of the of the of the collective enterprise so the, i'll stop there um i'd love to chat with you more about it and just give me a call at any time i hope i understood your question properly thanks jason we miss you here in uh -huh. person um so i just would want to add just to that that um, and thanks Nicola for that great um, question and Nicola is really also at the forefront of a lot of student activism and movements as well as local organizing in the city. And um, one thing I just want to mention is that the university itself as a public institution has a huge and we have many of them here in the city have a huge footprint here ecologically economically 
politically. Um, and one of the things um, that's mentioned in literature in relation to very large institutions is the potential that they can play as anchor institutions. And what that means is that large institutions such as this are also sites of economic exchange. And so it can really have a big influence on the forms that that exchange takes. As Jason already noted, there's eight to 10 or so um, solidarity economy initiatives already in operation. And so key questions are, what, where are resources being sourced from and under what conditions? Um, how is the, the universities are also in many ways themselves real estate developers. <laughs> They're in prime real estate in the city. How is that space used and for what purpose as a public institution? What are the public you know, uses? Um, who has access? When? And for what, for what ends? Um, and so I think there's a lot of questions uh, that could be posed about the role of the university in the city. Um, and I think with the neoliberalization of universities, and you know, I, I think Jason, you touched on this just a bit, but this question of neoliberalism is really manifest throughout our institutions and the university is no exception that this really pushes back against mobilizing and forging these connections. Uh, but Concordia has had a long history and legacy of student movement and mobilizations and taking the lead in defining these agendas. And uh, I, I'm hopeful that that can continue and that can play an important role in exposing not only the role universities currently play in these different fronts, the economic, the development, property development angle, um, and the political fronts and their potential for playing uh, other roles. Thank you, Norma. Um, we're gonna take a couple more questions. The next one, I think Patrick Barnard, you'd be um, the best to, to respond. Um, Matthew Chapman, I'll read it, unless you wanna go on your microphone, I'll give you a second if you choose to. Don't hear Matthew Chapman, so I'll go ahead and um, and ask Matthew's question. So Matthew Chapman asks, one of the watershed decisions in the environmental movement was to establish the IPCC and thus provide a source of relative scientific consensus. To what extent does the UN habitat play this role for exemplary urban development and should efforts be made to further legitimize that institution or another that could play such a global role? Yes, this is a question from Matt, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't know enough about all of this to be able to properly answer that question, honestly. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I no, wish no, I no. could. Um, I, I, I will say one thing that somehow, this isn't directly connected to that, but it's connected to a lot of other things. The cities in Canada are creatures of the provinces. The legislation that governs, formerly governs the city of Montreal is the City and Towns Act. And Linda Goulai's point was illustrated for me when I happened to be in a meeting of people from all sorts of municipalities around, uh, around Quebec. And as uh, someone said, well, there were a couple of things said that I never forgot, one was, so what that person meant was in smaller municipalities, it's still the notab, the, the respected members of the community who run things. And someone else said, and when we try and, and resist something, mostly about the environment, but it applied to many other things, we have to go to court, we often lose, and then it's going to cost us 40 or $50,000. So municipalities, are, it's not just Montreal, all over Quebec are in the most terrible straitjacket. So what can be done in terms of organizing? Now, I'm going to put forward an idea which I'm sure lots of people have thought about. It's not so easy because it involves risks and work and other such things. But I think in the next few years, concerned Montrealers should not wait for the city to act about certain things. Now, what that means, I'm not quite sure. So I'll just, I'm just 
thinking off the top of my head, but let's say there's a housing problem in one small place. So somehow you get somebody who has some property and is sympathetic and you build a model house, just one or two. And you show somehow that if people have just a little margin, they actually can build housing for themselves. Now, John Bradley is listening. He's an expert on housing. I'm not. But, you know, he's repeatedly told me, look, federal government left social housing a long time ago. Uh, social housing is terribly dependent upon the provincial government. But I honestly, I probably am not right here, but I've wondered whether some sort of autonomous social housing entity could be created by people outside the normal structures. I mean, it could be very small, but it would be electrified. You know, the, the Montreal Housing Cooperative, they just, it's not easy to do. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is something like this. The City and Towns Act is terribly confining. Uh, there's an awful lack of democracy in cities in, in across Quebec. Executive committees determine everything. We don't even get a chance to see what they talk about, which is unbelievably wrong. Something should be done about that. The other thing is, I think that the autonomous actions of citizens provide some uh, antidote to this terrible situation, which affects municipalities everywhere. And maybe that's an idea too. There are other people in other cities that we may not have thought about. I mean, I'm just going to Sherbrooke, Gatineau, who might be willing to get together with people from Montreal and say, we have the same problems. Let's see if we can have a kind of federation of you know, autonomous housing collectives, things like that. In other words, reaching out to other cities because they do suffer from the same thing. Hmm. So anyway, I don't know if that helps. Certainly. And I never got to tell my story, but I'll skip that for another time. No, I'm kidding. No. I had an October 16th. <laughs> That's right. Yes. I, that I'm looking, the French edition of the book is very important. Yes. So maybe I can talk to you about that later. Okay? Yes. Because people have asked me for chapters and things. Okay. Anyway, thanks. I don't know if that works. <laughs> thank you very much, Patrick. Patrick. <laughs> so thank you so much. So um, I want to uh, read out uh, one of Linda Goulain's responses for people who are here because they can't read it. And then I want to do one more question and then we'll wrap up because um, I think we were hoping to finish at 430. But of course, these things always end up going longer when there are so many good uh, questions and just a lot of energy around this book. But Linda Galai said, uh, in response to Maria and Sam, I think the bureaucratization has occurred in politics as well. Since the merger, City Hall functions more like a mini national assembly, press badges required, city and provincial flags and podiums at scrums, no access to politicians except through a public relations person, no interviews with civil servants. So I think uh, that is a, a great contribution to that aspect of the conversation. Now, the last question um, I just want to make sure gets asked, um, unless there's anybody who wants to ask via microphone, a final question, because Maria already did ask one. So if I'll give like five seconds, if anybody wants to pipe up over the microphone, you can do so now. Want to give everyone an opportunity? Okay, so uh, Maria asks, what are the private uses of our public universities? Um, Total and Viola and Suez extracting knowledge, capitalizing and gaining exposure to the city's assets. Um, is there anybody who wants to talk about the relationship to uh, Are there anybody who wants to respond to that? Okay, I don't have any responses. Sorry, Maria. Perhaps you can uh, email the contributor you think you would be most well suited to respond to that. Um, there's one thing I wanted to mention. Um, Claudia Leduc, who's in the chat, asked me to mention that at the end of my book, because it's been mentioned several times, mostly by me, is an English translation of the FRAP Manifesto, um, which was the founding document for the FRAP, which I've, I've talked about. Um, and she wanted to highlight that that's available there. And the French translation, um, we are putting on the Pernon Laville website 
um, shortly. So that will be available there. It's a very interesting historical document, which I think um, is remarkable for how relevant it remains today. Um, Mustafa, oh, did you want to? Do you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. go ahead, Eric, and then Mustafa, and then we'll close out. Yeah, just quickly, um, the, the the book ends, the conclusion ends with the Prino La Ville uh, Manifesto. So um, if you want to see where we're going with that, please look at the book. Thank you. Yeah, one more thing, the French version of the book is available as an ebook and will be in uh, as a paper copy in less than two weeks. Yes, and I'll just say the, the uh, there's a global supply chain shortage that's holding up the French book. So apologies for that. We wish we could uh, resolve the, the supply chain shortages so we can have it here today. <laughs> go ahead, Mustafa. No, I, I, I just wanted to go back to uh, a few like factual things around. Uh, there was Scott's question uh, and, and Eric's answered it brilliantly. But what, when he's talking about international trade and the research that came up, it's, it's uh, uh, we have a pretty vile uh, ruling class in this town and a uh, group of real estate developers and a little anecdote of how far they're willing to go for profit when it comes to real estate is uh, a common name that you'll see everywhere is Mondev. Uh, Mondev might be one of the first real estate developers to use NAFTA to try to force municipal governments to toe a line. And uh, it actually wasn't in Montreal, but uh, Mondev used Chapter 11 in NAFTA, you know, which has been reserved for pretty significant investment. It's a, the investment dispute mechanism uh, between the US, Mexico, and Canada for the rights of investors. And it was the first time a real estate developer tried to go after a public, public entity in the city of Boston, because the city of Boston refused them the right to have an endless mall expansion. And, and that would curtail their right to profit. Uh, and Mondev went as far as using NAFTA, which is an actual secret and yet uh, not a toothless. It actually has uh, a, a real mechanism uh, to enforce their will upon a city. Right. And so it is a real uh, power struggle. I, they lost, thankfully. Um, but it uh, just goes to say how far some of these real estate developers are willing to go. But one of the things that is discussed uh, in the book in Ron Rayside's chapter, uh, but also in, in passing, and it was the section that we kind of didn't have time to go really in depth, was the power of planning. Right. And this. Uh, that the power of planning, both for good and for profit, uh, is a power that cities actually have. Uh, and it's kind of this unsaid power. And it was something that uh, Jason Prince is really the expert on the, on the and I, I mean, I learned a lot from him, but uh, there is quite a bit of power within, within process of planning, right? How is land allocated? Who then is uh, allowed access to that land? I mean, one of the things that we see is, is transport-oriented development, right? Which sounded really nice. It was public transit, uh, creating local communities, uh, redensification, uh, doing away with urban sprawl. And it's become a neoliberal nightmare for the most part in the city of Montreal, right? And that, uh, and again, so there, there is that, the, but there is that power and, and that, but to go back to uh, Maria's question, actually, in Montreal, I mean, in Concordia, uh, you know, uh, Devimco, one of the largest developers in, or the largest single developer in the city of Montreal, uh, funds almost exclusively the Global Cities Institute here at Concordia, right? So, uh, and very much being able to use these kind of buzzwords and these battle of ideas in, into the future of our, of our city. So. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we're not done just yet, um, but I do, this is going to be my last comment. I want to thank all the contributors, the participants for the great questions. Um, 
I also want to thank the fourth space at Concordia, which did a really excellent job of, of hosting us and putting this excellent uh, technology to use and, and giving us a space that's dynamic and spacious and safe. Um, uh, so thank you to fourth space. I was going to pass it off to Anna, who's somewhere, maybe on Zoom. Oh, there we go. Um, who's going to close us out. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jason. I noticed you have one more comment in the chat. I'm not sure if you want to reply to it, maybe via text, but um, I'll take this moment to, if we're ping-ponging thanks, then I'm throwing the ball right back at you. Uh, thanks so much for the great moderation that you um, did today and for being super keen and here early and setting up this beautiful book display behind you. And all of you who made the trip into the space, we appreciate you uh, going that extra mile. I know it's not possible for everyone. Poor Jason is sick in bed and we wish you all the best, Jason. We hope you get well soon. Um, everyone who joined us on Zoom, we really appreciate you making the, the time in your schedule to be here today and for animating the chat and the discussion uh, in such a lively way. That was really great. Thanks everybody. So I'll just remind folks, just because I've gotten a few questions about it, that yes, we did actually live stream this event onto YouTube and therefore the recording is there now available for you. So I'll send a follow-up email to all who registered um, with that link. But if you just look up Concordia University Fourth Space, you'll find us on YouTube. And it's there now if you want to share with colleagues, friends, and all who missed this great event. So thanks again to Jason for the moderation. Um, Mustafa, you did you you got the pachacucha going. That was great. Good. <laughs> we got the timers uh, going, and all the panelists and participants who um, gave their ideas and thoughts contributed to this uh, event today. We really appreciate it. Okay, folks. So we're gonna close up the Zoom now. For those of you uh, in the space, you're welcome to hang out a little longer if you'd like to do so. Um, otherwise, I know you have that Senka set you're all burning to go to, so please do enjoy. And uh, on that note, we'll say goodbye to everybody. Okay, thanks. Have a great evening. Bye. Is this off? Oh, I'm off. Yeah, you're on. Okay, we're done. We're done.